welcome back to uh, Miss Yusuf's English class. Uh, in this video, we're going to read chapter 54 and chapter 55 of The Life of Pi. Don't forget that all the other chapters are available uh, in different videos on the channel, so do check them out. Uh, let's get into chapter 54 and chapter 55. It rained all night. I had a horrible sleepless time of it. It was noisy. On the rain catcher, the rain made a drumming sound and around me, coming from the darkness beyond, it made a hissing sound as if I were at the center of a great nest of angry snakes. Shifts in the wind changed the direction of the rain so that parts of me that were beginning to feel warm were soaked anew. I shifted the rain catcher only to be unpleasantly surprised a few minutes later when the wind changed once more. I tried to keep a small part of me dry and warm around my chest where I had placed the survival manual but the wetness spread with perverse determination. I spent the whole night shivering with cold. I worried constantly that the raft would come apart, that the knots holding me to the lifeboat would become loose, that a shark would attack. With my hands I checked the knots and lashings incessantly, trying to read them the way a blind man would read braille. The rain grew stronger and the sea rougher as the night progressed. The rope to the lifeboat tautened uh, with a jerk rather than with a tug, and the rocking of the raft became, a more pronounced, uh, became more pronounced and erratic. It continued to float, rising above every wave, but there was no free board, and the surf of every breaking wave rode clear across it, washing around me like a river washing around a boulder. The sea was warmer than the rain, but it meant that not the small as part of me stayed dry that night. At least I drank. I wasn't really thirsty, but I forced myself to drink. The rain catcher looked like an inverted umbrella, an umbrella blown open by the wind. The rain flowed to its centre where there was a hole. The hole was connected by a rubber tube to a catchment pouch made of thick transparent plastic. At first the water had a rubbery taste, but quickly the rain rinsed the catcher and the water tasted fine. During those long, cold, dark hours, as the pattering of the invisible rain got to be deafening and the sea hissed and coiled and tossed, about, uh, tossed me about, I held on to one thought. Richard Parker. I hatched several plans to get rid of him so that the lifeboat uh, might be mine. Plan number one. Push him off the lifeboat. What good would that do? Even if I did manage to shove 450 pounds of living fierce animal off the lifeboat, tigers are accomplished swimmers. In the Sundarbans, they have been known to swim five miles in open choppy waters. If he found himself unexpectedly overboard, Richard Parker would simply tread water, climb back aboard and make me pay the price for my treachery. Plan number two, kill him with six morphine syringes, but I had no idea what effect that would have on him. Would they be enough to kill him? And how exactly was I supposed to get the morphine into his system? I could remotely conceive surprising him once for an instant, the way his mother may have uh, when she was captured, but to surprise him long enough to uh, give him six consecutive injections? Impossible. All I would do by pricking him with a needle would be to get a cuff in return that would take my head off. Plan 3. Attack him with all available weaponry. Ludicrous. I wasn't Tarzan. I was a puny, feeble, vegetarian life form. In India, I took riding atop a, a great big elephant and shooting with powerful rifles to kill tigers. What uh, was I supposed to do here? Fire off a rocket flare in his face? Go at him with a hatchet in each hand with a knife between my teeth? Finish him off with straight and curving sewing needles? If I managed to nick him, it would be a fate. In return, he would tear me apart limb by limb, organ by organ. For if there's one thing more dangerous than a healthy animal, it's an injured animal. Plan number four, choke him. I had rope. If I stayed at the bow and got the rope to go around the stern and a noose to go around his neck, I could pull on the rope while he pulled to get at me. And so, in the very act of reaching for me, he would choke himself. A clever suicidal plan. Plan number five, poison him, set him on fire, electrocute him. How and with what? Plan number six, the war of attrition. All I had to do was let the unforgiving laws of nature run their course and I would be saved. Wait for him to waste away and die would require no effort on my part. 
I had supplies for months to come. What did he have? Just a few dead animals that would soon go bad. What would he eat after that? Better still, where would he get water? He might last a few weeks without food, but no animal, however mighty, can do without water for any extended period of time. A modest glow of hope flickered to life within me like a candle in the night. I had a plan, and it was a good one. I only needed to survive to put it into effect. Okay, chapter 55. Dawn came and matters were worse for it because now, emerging from the darkness, I could see what before I had only felt. The grey curtains of rain crashing down on me from towering heights and the waves that threw a path over me and trod me underfoot one after another. Dull-eyed, shaking and numb, one hand gripping the rain catcher, the other clinging to the raft, I continued to wait. Sometime later, with a suddenness emphasised by the silence that followed, the rain stopped. The sky cleared and the waves seemed to flee with the clouds. The change was as quick and radical as changing countries on land. I was now in a different ocean. Soon the sun was alone in the sky and the ocean was a mirror, a smooth, sorry, skin reflecting the light with a million mirrors. I was stiff, sore and exhausted, barely grateful to be still alive. The words plan number six, plan number six, Plan number six repeated themselves in my head like a mantra and brought me a small measure of comfort, though I couldn't recall for the life of me what plan number six was. Warmth started coming to my bones. I closed the rain catcher. I wrapped myself with a blanket and curled up on my side in such a way that no part of me touched the water. I fell asleep. I don't know how long I slept. It was mid-morning when I woke and hot. The blanket was nearly dry. It had been a brief bout of deep sleep and I lifted myself onto an elbow. All about me was flatness and infinity, an endless panorama of blue. There was nothing to block my view. The vastness hit me like a punch in the stomach. I fell back, winded. This raft was a joke. It was nothing but a few sticks and a, a little cork held together by string. Water came through every crack. The depth beneath would make a bird dizzy. I caught sight of the lifeboat. It was no better than half a walnut shell. It held onto the surface of the water like fingers gripping the edge of a cliff. It was only a matter of time before gravity pulled it down. My fellow castaway came into view. He raised himself onto the gunwale and looked my way. The sudden appearance of a tiger is arresting in any environment, but it was all the more so here. The weird contrast between the bright striped uh, living orange of its coat and the inert white of the boat's hull was incredibly compelling. My overwrought senses screeched to a halt. Vast as the Pacific around us was, suddenly, between us, it seemed a very narrow moat with no bars or walls. Plan number six, plan number six, plan number six, my mind whispered urgently. But what was plan number six? Ah, yes. The war of attrition. The waiting game. Passivity. Letting things happen. The unforgiving laws of nature. The restless march of time and the hoarding of resources. That was plan number six. A thought rang in my mind like an angry shout. You fool! An idiot, you dimwit, you brainless baboon. Plan number six is the worst plan of all. Richard Parker is afraid of the sea right now. It was nearly his grave. But crazed with thirst and hunger, he will surmount his fear and he will do whatever is necessary to appease his need. He will turn this moat into a bridge. He will swim as far as he has to, to catch the drifting raft and the food upon it. As for water, have you forgotten that tigers from the Sundarbans were known to drink saline water? Do you really think you can outlast his kidneys? I tell you, if you wage the war of attrition, you will lose it. You will die. Is that clear? Right, that brings us to the end of chapter 55. Stay tuned for chapter 56.